Thank you so much. I don't think I've ever seen this many people in Federation Hall ever. This is an auspicious day and something I know many people have waited for for a long time, but it would only be right and proper for us to start this day correctly. To acknowledge the fact that we meet today in the lands of the Bunwurrung people, the Yalakut Willem clan, who have sung their songs and danced their dances here since the very beginnings of time. For over two and a half thousand generations, this country has had stories poured into it. And that didn't stop 231 years ago. Those stories were added to. And the stories of this place have remained for all that time. My name's Tiriki Yonas, I'm a Yorta Yorta and Jar Jar Wurrung fellow. And it always gives me a great honour to acknowledge this country. To know that I stand on the shoulders of, as we say in my Yorta Yorta language, those Yenbana, those old people who have made this place what it is. And it's their voices that I believe come back to all of us who stand on this country. If we listen hard enough, if we take the time, we hear the stories of those Yalakut Willem people. We hear those Bunwarang voices coming back to us. And we hear them say to us, Waminjika, to welcome us here to this country when we acknowledge those voices and we acknowledge this place. And so it's a great joy to bring new people to this country, to be able to welcome friends from other lands, other Aboriginal nations. Let's not forget there are over 300 different nations in this continent alone. But to acknowledge our friends who have come across the sea to stand here on this Bunwarang country with us and to celebrate the stories of this place. And so to everyone, I say, and I've been given permission by my elder auntie Carolyn Briggs to say, Waminjika. Welcome to this country. And please take that moment, take a moment to listen for the voices of those Yinbana. Because what we do here, singing our songs, dancing our dances, telling our story, is no different from what those old people have done. Whether we're playing on boomerangs and possum skin drums or on a double bass and a Bösendorfer, these stories remain the same. And the gift that we bring this country is our stories the stories that we pour in here, that I certainly hope our great-great-grandchildren will be standing around in another two and a half thousand generations celebrating the stories we make here together. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I pass over now to my brother, William Barton, to introduce some of our extraordinary guests. Guess what, a couple of great days coming up and to explore the diversity and listen to the stories through music, through jazz and through world peace with UNESCO. It's such an important thing to, to be uh, immersed in cultural identity and language, musical language, and how every particle of the universe we, we are a part of and it's what we take from those particles and we become that particle and give back to the song lines of the country through our art form that we practice. We practice it like a religion and it's our culture. And to converse on stage with wonderful musicians from around the world is what makes International Jazz Day um, such a magnificent thing to be a part of. Because we are all storytellers of the next generation and we are here to pass on that culture. And to listen to Uncle Herbie Hancock, one of our greatest legends, Live the living legends uh, today, the great treat for all. And so we'll all take something away from that. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mika Shino. I'm the director of International Jazz Day Program and Outreach for the Hanbury Hancock Institute of Jazz. I would like to acknowledge the elders, families, and descendants of the Bujunra people who have been and are the custodians of these lands. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UNESCO, the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz, and James Morrison Academy of Music, 
I would like to welcome you to the International Jazz Day in Melbourne. It is a great honor for us to be here with you today for the eighth International Jazz Day, a day that aims to foster peace and intercultural dialogue across the world. Today, Jazz Day is being celebrated in 195 countries in events small and big, so it's a wonderful time to unite through jazz. I would like to express our gratitude to the state of Victoria and the Department of Communication and Arts of the Australian government. I would also like to express our uh, gratitude to the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music and the amazing team led by Elena Del Mercado, Susan Bird, and Rob Binks. I would also like to express our gratitude to the Carnival Corporation for their generous support of International Jazz Day education programs. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Culture, Mr. Ernesto Atone. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this master class on the occasion of the 2019 celebration of International, International Jazz Day. Jazz, as you know, is a powerful art form, as well as a unifying force, a platform for dialogue and the channel for freedom of expression. It is uh, in this spirit that in 2011, UNESCO created International Jazz Day. This masterclass will show how a jazz group works together to create a piece of music. UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador Herbie Hancock will be working alongside the musicians he selected for the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz. These musicians are all exceptional artists and you will be able to see the magic of music creation right here and now. And now I have the honor of introducing you to a legend, an icon, a visionary and an incredible humanitarian who was at the origin of creating International Jazz Day. He is a multi-Grammy winning and Oscar winning artist who has dedicated his life to fostering peace and intercultural dialogue through music. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador Herbie Hancock. Thank you very, very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and I really appreciate your enthusiastic greeting to all of us. We're, we're really happy about what we're doing today and what we're doing tomorrow, and how it's reverberating around the world, and it really is. International Jazz Day is going to be celebrated in 195 countries. I think that's all that there are in the world. You know, we have to go to the satellite to find a new place, right? Don't worry, Elon Musk is gonna take us to Mars, so. To, <laughs> you know, maybe in uh, 20 years we'll celebrate International Jazz Day on Martian territory. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Let me introduce you, oh, who are these guys? <laughs> okay, these are the fellows, and they are incredible. Um, you're going to have a, a great time listening to the, what they're able to do on their instruments. So let me, let me introduce you to, to each one. First of all, on, on trumpet, well, actually, might as well do him first. This is Ronnie Eitan on harmonica. And we have Aidan Lombard on trumpet. And Leonard Simpson, an alto saxophone. Chris Lewis on tenor saxophone. This is uh, Emma Dayhoff 
on bass. And Malachi Whitson on drums. I almost forgot. I'm, a, I'm always the pianist, so I forgot. There's a, they have their own pianist, right? This is Paul Cornish on piano. We're going to do something really special today. Uh, I think. Uh, I think Aiden, was it Aiden that you figured out the? We came up with it together. You came up. Oh, you. They came up with the idea of, of what we're going to present today. Anybody want to explain it to the audience? Yeah. First of all, how about another hand for the great Herbie Hancock? <laughs> We're all so grateful to be here, so thank you for having us. Um, we're here to talk about composition, and we have uh, one of the great composers of the jazz dialect here. Um, there are so many amazing... <laughs> <laughs> he contributed so many amazing, what we call jazz standards, that are played by masters and students alike probably every day. And uh, we're going to start with a tune called Maiden Voyage of his. Uh, it is a, a great framework for improvisation and incredibly strong composition. Um, after that, we're going to create a composition on stage, and we're going to involve everybody on stage, everybody in the audience, and hopefully we're going to have something concrete and playable at the end of it. So you're, uh, we're, we're throwing ourselves into the fire here, so give us a break. You know, <laughs> don't be too critical. Okay, here's a maiden voyage. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Herbie has an amazing story that he tells about uh, the process of how he wrote this composition and uh, the process of starting this composition, of finishing this composition. And I think uh, there's a lot to learn from this story about the, the, particularly the process of starting and finishing compositions. So I want to turn it over to the great Herbie Hancock. I don't know about the great Herbie Hancock. I, actually, I'm the only Herbie Hancock. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one in this body. That's, that's, that's all. Hello. So, um, so I wanted to find some kind of rhythm, but that wasn't just a regular kind of backbeat, right? And I wanted to have some different kind of rhythm. And I didn't know what that would be, but I had to go with the Miles Davis band from New York, where I lived at that time, to California. On board the plane, doing a conversation with Wayne Shorter, who was sitting right next to me, Wayne was explaining something to me, I, I don't remember what now. All of a sudden, this rhythm hits me, and it was that one that we played. Don't, 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 don't. And, and so, so I grabbed the flight attendant and I said, please give me a piece of paper. She gave me a napkin. I wrote the rhythm down. And I said, that's, that's the rhythm I want. And I lost the piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell you this part of the story, so you don't, you don't know this part. So um, one of the things that we had to do you know, with the Miles Davis band, we were actually making a record. Um, also in Los Angeles. And uh, one of the songs, which was uh, called 81, that was written by Ron Carter, the, the bass player. Um, after we did the take that we really wanted, we're listening to the playback of that recording and that particular tune at the very end of it. And if anybody has that record, they can hear that the, at the very end of it, that rhythm, I played it without even thinking about it. it. I didn't even know I had played that rhythm until I heard it coming back through the speakers. I said, that's the rhythm I had on the plane, right? So that was the beginning of Maiden Voyage. Later on, when I got back to Los Angeles, I figured out the first chords, right? Uh, let me change mics. This is going to be a very long story, sorry. Uh, so after I had gotten the, well, let me move, change the sound here. Uh, let me find a keyboard sound so it'll make some kind of sense. Um, OK, maybe this. <laughs> Maybe that was the rhythm I should have had. I don't know. <laughs> so after I had this part, right, and then when it goes to, like that. Uh, and finally I figured figured out. somehow come to the home key. You know, songs usually end with something like a. Right? You got to come home to something. And so I was at the end of that second part. So I had to start from the beginning again. I could not, 
Two hours went by, like at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I could only get to that one point, and I had to start over again. All of a sudden, it occurred to me, you don't have to go to a home key. It's like a voice in my head. You don't have to go to a home key. You have the song already. I said, wait, every song goes to a home key. Doesn't have to. <laughs> I, I hadn't heard a song that didn't go to a home key. But this one doesn't go to a home key. And it's complete as it is. That's how Maiden Voyage was written. Anyway, shall we go on? <laughs> <laughs> So um, what we're going to try to do here, does anybody have the time, by the way? Uh, it's 2.34. OK, so we have 26 minutes to write a song. Great. Um, <laughs> so we wrote half of it. It was me talking. <laughs> Aiden, you can go over. Oh, excellent. By 10 minutes. OK, cool. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, some of the, the basic compositional elements of this song that make it great. Um, as Herbie said, the first thing that we have is a rhythm. It started with a rhythm. And so that's where we're going to start here. And I think Roni is going to give us a rhythm to work with. So Roni, can you clap a, uh, a two-bar cycling rhythm into the microphone? Yeah. Oh, you want me to hold the mic? Great. So. <laughs> so we already got past uh, the hardest part. We've started. So um, now here's where things get interesting. Can I get uh, some brave volunteers? Mm -hmm. Show of hands. OK. My man, pick a note. C. C. Okay. The people's key. Excellent. Can I get a second volunteer? In the back. A flat. A flat. OK. We've got two. We're, almost, we're halfway there. I need two more volunteers. My man. G flat. G flat. We have C, A flat, G flat. G flat? Yeah. In the red. E. E. Wow. OK. OK. <laughs> cool. Whole tone. No, that's cool, actually. Now we, we, have, we have one option. <laughs> Great. So these are going to be, so we're going to write a song not exactly based on Maiden Voyage, but we're going to try to replicate the process by which one of the most important jazz standards that people play and that people learn. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Paul and Herbie. And uh, they're going to make something out of that rhythm and uh, those four notes. And um, I'm going to say that those notes, we have C, A flat, G flat, and E. They can be in any order, in any order. But we're going to make a, a 32 bar AABA -A form. We're going to set that. By the way, let me introduce Daniel Seif, the West Coast Director of the Herbie Hancock Institute. Thank you.
I will be uh, moderating this game, this uh, sporting event. <laughs> so, uh, Paul and Herbie are going to uh, think on their feet right now. And uh, they're going to arrange this in a certain order that creates uh, this spiraling form of, uh, of 32 bars that we have in Maiden Voyage. So, uh, let's give them some time to think. You want us to do it as a, do this as a melody? Those. No, these are, are the roots. So like these are the roots, it, okay. Right. And it can be any, any structure above the root. That's what they're figuring out right now. Well, there could be four different chords, right? That was amazing. I just have to say, uh, that was, inc I did not expect that. <laughs> um, amazing. Yeah. So uh, can we, can we uh, tell the audience what those chords are and how they work and how they flow into each other? Hello. Uh, uh, so, uh, like Aiden said, we picked uh, the notes that you picked, and uh, we use them as the bass note or the root um, as a basis for our harmony. And so we, we started with, the, with C, and uh, Herbie played a C minor chord. And then we then went to A flat. Uh, and this is what is called a sus chord, or so A flat, so we have C minor to A flat sus. And then on the B section, which is the third section of this form, which is um, we're taking away from Maiden Voyage, we um, play the D over F sharp chord, because F sharp or G flat was one of the notes chosen. And then we move to an E chord, uh, and then back to the C minor. I don't know, did that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The D chord and the, the E chord are in what's called an inversion. So regular D chord is like this. And the regular E chord is that. But this was... It's a D chord, but it's a different inversion. So the bottom note is different than that. In the E chord, we did the same thing, the same kind of inversion. We call that the first inversion. Because a regular E chord would be this. So that's the first inversion, and this is the second inversion. Just because the, the bottom note changes. So we have the rhythm. And we have the harmony, and now we need Aiden, rhythm and harmony, and what, what are you going to work on next? Now it's time to complete the rhythm section before we add the horns. So uh, part of the role of the bass is uh, to, to fill these spaces that are created by this rhythm. 
um, part of the, the in Maiden Voyage, we have a, a rhythm that's cycling. And if you hear the bass each time, it uh, fills into one in the space that's left, that's created by the rhythm. And it creates kind of this uh, rhythmic structure that feels complete and solid. So we're going to uh, start this cycle again. And Emma is going to uh, begin to construct a bass line that works around these hits, but also fills in the spaces, which uh, something really cool about this rhythm that Roni created is that it doesn't have the one. <laughs> and it has the four that can almost feel like the one. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of potential for Emma to cr create some interesting ways to fill these spaces. So let's see what happens. All of you understand exactly what we're talking about, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Actually, before we do that, are there any questions from the audience? Is there any, can anything be made uh, clearer so you uh, feel like you're getting the inside view of what's happening? We can't see them. There's no light on them. They turned out the lights. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to... I'm going to take that to mean that no every, everybody's following along. Raise your hand with your phone or something. <laughs> with the light on so we can see. Okay. I don't see any hands, so <laughs> Emma, take it away. Paul, you want to play the chords? Count it again, count it again. Paul, play the chords along with her. Want to just work on the on the second section on the B section? So we have the first part. Now we're going to sort out the second part.
almost there. Now it's time to get the horns involved. So, I, I feel, I'm feeling Leonard and Chris have, have some ideas about how to connect these chords, how to create a melody that accents these rhythms. Let's get back, get back to the A section. So the group has the melody for the second section, and now they're going to work out the melody for the first section.
So. <laughs> Now it's time to, uh, to play this composition. Let's talk about a few uh, horn arrangement things of that, of that uh, melody. I, the cool thing about the melody that was just created is that it kind of has a call and response aspect to it, which is a big thing in jazz throughout the entire history of the music. So um, let's, uh, let's talk about who plays those two parts throughout the whole. So um, what? That could be the new groove, honestly. There we go. <laughs> so can we get that, that uh, saxophone melody on the first section happening? One, two, one, two, three, four. So for the first section, we'll have the saxophones uh, play the, the, the call, and Roni and I will play the response. And then we'll switch when we get to the bridge. Um, so what we'll have is uh, Roni and I will play. Can we get the, the bridge happening? One, two, three. <laughs> Everybody feel ready? We good? Everybody know how many times everything is happening? I think so. I think okay. we'll keep it A A B A. Okay. All right. Let's give it a try then. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to play through the composition? Then maybe you could take a solo on it.
Anybody want some deodorant? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think at this point we're just going to open it up for questions. Yeah, if there are a few questions, anybody have any questions for the band, Herbie Hancock? Give it a title. Wow, give it a title. Ooh. Who has a title for it? Malachi? We should ask them for the title. The audience? Yeah. yeah. Someone in the audience should, should uh, title it since you, uh, the audience contributed to the. That's the Jeffrey Mercury. Yes. Rock My Soul. Rock My Soul. Okay. That's it. Rock My Soul by Herbie Hancock, Paul Cornish, Ronnie Etan, Aiden Lombard, Leonard Simpson, Chris Lewis, Emma Dayoff, and Malachi Whitson with help from a uh, hundred other participants. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. I have a question I want to ask. Uh, sure. Um, I hope it's not a stupid question, but I, what I want to ask you is, in terms of modal plane, are there any uh, superimposed worlds that you put on a modal world um, that would surprise us? Like, are there any, like, say you're playing in one key, say C minor, is there anything that you do in C minor that would surprise us that is like a sort of, you know, secret recipe of No, it's not an odd question, and I have an answer. It's probably an odd answer, but um, it's a very simple answer to that: to do something that's not in C minor, right? Do something in another place. Then you have to figure out how to get out of that to go to C minor so that it makes some kind of sense. That's just one approach. So you do something that's not where we expect you to go. And then you have to figure out how can I have that make sense? So, and you have to do it quickly, <laughs> right? Because the music keeps moving along, just like time, you know? Because the music is, you know, in this case, is in time. I'm sorry? 
There's no go-to setting, no. That depends on your own uh, creativity and your own courage. And it's something that if you have enough courage, enough balls to do it in the first place, you know, may not sound so good in the beginning, <laughs> but you keep doing that little by little, and eventually you might get pretty good at, at coming up with better solutions. But it has to start with maybe the solutions not being so, so great. And you have to be willing to kind of take that. But uh, the more you try, the better you get at it. And so the, the, the key word is courage. That's what it takes. And that's, anybody that plays jazz has to have courage. Because that's what the playing is about. We don't know exactly what we're going to play. And we have to start somewhere. So we start somewhere, and then we have to figure out how to make it make sense. Question from here. Uh, question for Debbie. How do you approach practice? So you say there's something you want to work on, you just sit in the practice room until you get it, and then are you happy with that, or are you more like, okay, I'm going to work on this for a little bit, maybe five or ten minutes, and I'm going to next thing I'll do it again tomorrow, the next day, or somewhere in between? Uh, I don't have any like secret solution to, to, to that. Uh, what you just described is fine. There's not a whole lot of like secret stuff that you have to pass through certain uh, uh, tunnels to get there. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Maybe I'll try what you just said. <laughs> yeah. Okay, a couple more. We have a question here. On Sun Ra. My opinion on Sun Ra? And his approach to collective improvisation. And oh, his approach. Okay. I, mean, I, I hate to keep answering all the questions, but uh, Sun Ra, uh, I, I met him a few times uh, because he spent a lot of time in Chicago, and that's my hometown. Um, Sun Ra, for people who may not know, was uh, uh, one of the earlier avant-garde jazz players. Um, but he, it was more than just weird, strange stuff. It was, uh, a lot of it was based off of a very old um, uh, explorations of the, of the blues. And, because uh, Sun Ra was born, I think, in the, I know he was born in the 30s or before, that, that I know. And uh, anyway, uh, I didn't like Sun Ra when I first heard him, but I was, I was very young and I didn't know what was going on. It took me years of my own growth to really appreciate what Sun Ra was doing. And so w one thing that um, I wanna share with you, and that is that uh, uh, it's very important to re-examine uh, ideas that you maybe have held on to for a long time and be willing to uh, find new ways of looking at things. And that can come from new experiences. You know, but uh, to lock yourself into a, a kind of a box in your way of thinking, you know, just imagine if you did that, you were a kid, right? You'd never get out of the, out of the crib. You'd never learn to walk. You'd ne never learn to talk. You know, they see what others are doing and, and they learn from it and they figure it out. Basically, they figure it out for themselves. You don't actually teach somebody how to walk. I don't think, nobody learns that way, right? They figure it out for themselves. Somewhere along the way, adults have forgotten how to actually kind of figure out for themselves by paying attention to what others are doing or what others are, are thinking. And as long as you're open enough, you know, to re and, and remain open throughout your life, that gives you an opportunity to grow and to expand. It's only when we 
lock ourselves into our comfort zone, that growth stops. And if growth stops, living stops. We don't want that to happen. That kind of explains what jazz is about. Jazz is about listening to new ideas and constantly expanding, constantly be willing to challenge yourself and not just challenging others, being willing to listen to some new ideas that maybe you didn't like before, but exploring new territory, you know, carving out new territory. So it takes courage and conviction and trust, trust of yourself and trust of, of others. You know? And the key word for that is, is respect. You, know? you have to respect yourself, but it's important to respect others too, because they may have information that they can impart to you that could be life-changing for the better. Oh, voice and chords. Um, I used to think about, you know, chords. Um, every chord you have to play. Uh, you're a musician, so this is m many of you who are, may, are not musicians may not get this, but you know, basically I was taught that every chord there, uh, there was a third, and uh, um, either a, a seventh that was um, implied. Or, or that was actual, um, dominant seventh or major seventh. You know. um, but I learned actually from doing movie scores that you don't always have to play chords. Sometimes you can play two notes. Uh, you don't have to fill them up with the third and the seventh because after a while those, be those things begin to sound the same. But when you can, um, find other solutions that don't fit into that, um, you know, typical kind of qualification, then it's very freeing. And I, I learned something about that from actually doing movie scores, you know, that, that um, in the background behind something, you could just have two instruments that are playing uh, like, um, Let's see. And it might be appropriate for the film. And I thought, well, why don't I use that when I play jazz? You know? uh, and when I started doing that, I, f start, I, I freed myself from having to always play. I'm always having to play. You know, when I could do. Like that. The bass note was uh, like if the bass player were playing, playing that note, that was. But doing. need to actually just play chords all the time. You can play little melodies. You can play l little ideas. And so that gave me a lot more material to draw from when I started thinking that way. Because if you think about um, uh, life has all, all, the, all the answers, right? Uh, if you walk down the street, there'll be several events happening. You may actually Maybe you're on the street because you wanted to get something to eat somewhere. But there's other people on the street, and they're, they have their own purpose. They're all doing other things. And, and even though you may have one particular reason why you're out there, there are other people doing other things. So you can use that as the kind of background or the landscape for accompaniment. You know that example of what other people may be doing. Or you can do some things with two different scenarios. There's a woman walking uh, 
she's got a, a baby in her arms and she's walking down the street. And then there are two kids that are kind of playing with a, with a ball, bouncing a ball and they're having fun and smiling. There's two different events that are happening at the same time. You can play that. I remember Wayne Shorter telling me that once he was walking down the street with Miles and then somebody uh, was walking near them and, and just kind of stumbled a little bit. Miles said, play that. <laughs> and when, when Wayne told me that story, that, that made me really think a lot. So the way Miles described it was much shorter than what I just told you, but it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that's all we have time for. Um, thank you for uh, participating and contributing ideas for the composition Rock My Soul. Let's hear uh, <laughs> right. an another thank round you. of applause for Malachi Whitson, Chris Lewis, Leonard Simpson, Aiden Lombard, Roni Eitan, Emma Dayhoff, Paul Cornish, and Mr. Herbie Hancock. <laughs>